<laughs> so, so who are you? Where are you in the world? Um, my name's Martin, um, and I'm in Harlem, which is the most beautiful city in the Netherlands, sitting in my um, dining room, I suppose, in a beautiful winter day. The sun is shining, it's freezing, so it can't get much better than that, uh, from a Dutch perspective at least. So we're here today to, to discuss a project which I recently did for um, uh, the, the Global Center for Climate Mobility, a UN foundation. And um, it, it, I think what brought me here uh, is um, <laughs> wanting a, a love of for documentary photography for as long as I can remember. I think I had my first subscription on National Geographic and Time magazine uh, when, when I was 11. It, it, I, I, I loved exploring the world through photography and, and a bit of a news junkie. But that led me at a uh, fortunately at a certain stage to a career at World Press Photo, uh, where I spent a lot a lot of time uh, actually um, uh, initially on the exhibitions department. Uh, but I quickly transitioned into the educational activities of the organization, which initially meant that we hosted master classes, we organized training programs, mainly in the developing world. And I met some wonderful and really inspiring people, which which sent me on a on a mission, if you will, um, to enable for, to enable photographers from around the world to tell their own stories. There's a wonderful uh, book that I read at a certain stage, which which spoke about um, imagine that we were we the UK where you are or the Netherlands where I'm based was represented solely by photographers from Nepal who didn't speak Dutch or English. And they said, well, that's actually the situation in most of the other uh, countries in the world where photographers don't speak or cameramen don't speak Arabic or Nepalese, and they're based in the capital. And then they go out if there's a story to be told. How would we feel about that? Um, and, and would it give us different stories? I've never been truly convinced, but I do feel it's really a matter of respect. So I set out on that journey, uh, which started with training, which became capacity building, uh, as we called it at the time, which basically meant that, okay, great if somebody from uh, Europe comes, but much better if we have the capability um, uh, to teach photojournalism in our countries ourselves and and what does that mean so that was a great uh, great experience a clean cut path my career um I, I would say not at all i got involved in um, the african climate mobility initiative uh through a friend who recommended me to a friend uh and that was around uh, december 2000 21 and it took a while because of christmas and new year before we eventually got the for the conversation uh, started and this was a, an, a project which was had already been running for for two years or maybe three years probably uh, there were if you go right back four years but it was about um mapping the uh the consequences of climate change different climate change scenarios and different developmental scenarios for mobility in Africa. So if, and then between now and 2050. So if the emissions stayed high and, and temperatures rose, if development, um, uh, economic development, social development, yeah, didn't take the, the, the most ideal scenario, what would that mean for movement within Africa? And Columbia University was involved in modeling um, uh, this work. So there was a lot of serious academic work had been done in, in well, prior to me getting involved. Uh, but then they ended up with a report and they knew that at that moment they had a challenge because academics are great at doing research um, they're not always the best communicators to a much wider audience. So that was the question that uh, um, that, that Kamal, the, 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 the organization director, approached me with, Martin, can you help me develop a platform 
with which we can get this out towards a much larger, wider audience. Climate change isn't necessarily perceived as mobility, but already there, there's um, we're talking about framing and we're talking about communications because I think a lot of people are quite aware of the link between climate change and the potential for migration. But there is a very, uh, particularly in the West, uh, um, a negative uh, sound to the word migration. It's not perceived as something desirable at this stage unless it's within, well, within the European Union. And I'll leave aside Brexit and the UK uh, for the moment. But already that choice for the word mobility is part of the communication efforts by this organization. Because if you look at, at Europe, um, we don't perceive that as a negative migration. People are moving around with skill sets that people can benefit from. They move somewhere for a couple of years, they move back. And there was this idea that, that the, the discussion needs to be reframed, not only on the negative, but also on the po potential positive impacts of people having to move either for always or temporarily or um, lead some kind of, of, of mobile existence because of changes to the climate. Some of the, the key challenges we faced when uh, conceiving this project, and, and I credit where credit is due, Kamal had already done a lot of thinking on it, was um, how are we going to get different audiences with different levels of interest to engage with the content. And uh, that already meant that because a report was the basis, a report was the basis of this project. So there had to be a report, but there's very few people who have the time and the knowledge and, 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 and are willing to read uh, a, a 100, 200 page report full of formulas, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, it, we the, we couldn't let the challenge stop us there because the content was is too important. So how do we get other audiences to engage? And ideally, how do we get them to engage more uh, profoundly with the content that we present them with? So visuals were one way of telling the story, but they were also... Uh, a pathway into into text uh, and ultimately into into the report. So there was a whole thinking of in layers, basically, of of different audiences, uh, different ways to access the the information. So that was one one very uh, yeah, fundamental challenge, if you will, which I think we we managed to deal with. Um, a, a challenge that we we uh, <laughs> where there is still room for improvement. Um, and this this has to do with with the timing that is available in in these project is, um, and and because it's a project also the longevity of of these initiatives is how do we um, enable engagement? How do we truly make? We have all this wonderful content. How do we actually get it shared? And and there's still a challenge there. Luckily, we have new opportunities in the future, looking at other regions of the world. But there is that challenge because we don't only want people to, to take that information in. Ideally, we want to share it, them to share it. We want them to talk about it. Um, uh, and we want them to become, yeah, sorry, we want them to become engaged with that, uh, with that content. Climate change is global, um, but solutions are local. And if you, if you look at that, the African political system, a lot of the decision-making is very centralized, but solutions are local. So how do we get this information to um, new groups of stakeholders, local policymakers, local journalists, local academics that can, that can use this information? That's really one of the things that, that's changed. And it, it, it was a fundamental starting point that these stories are going to be told by African uh, storytellers, which we did throughout the project. Uh, yes, there was a, a small a contingency budget if we couldn't find someone, but uh, even in a place like uh, Somaliland, Somalia, um, we we through networks we found very competent and capable 
uh, photographers. So, so that was that was great. Um, I, I think I missed one of the one of the the, the challenges with one of the main challenges, and this last one was a very uh, practical one, if you will. But one of the main communication challenges was that climate change is something that evolves very, very slowly. It's difficult to to get a sense of urgency. Um, it is something that is very often uh, hi not hidden, but described in dense reports. And um, how do you how do you get people? How do you create awareness? How do you create understanding? Uh, how do you create a sense of urgency about climate change? Um, and I think the way we resolved that was yes, there were words because this we also want to stimulate it. We also want to stimulate a facts based discussion, an academically uh, rooted in in academic research. Um, but at the same time, it needs to be accessible. So we use data visualizations and data visualizations are great tools for projections to the future, are great tools if you have complex information to simplify it, to make it immediately accessible. But that still doesn't necessarily move people. There's still not an emotive response to data visualizations as much as I like them. And that's where the photography and the video came in, because there you could tell very small stories which became examples for the larger trends and which drew people in and they could say hey this is not only going to happen here um, uh, the uh, flooding or 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 um, cyclones it's not only only Mozambique but look the the, the coasts of, of um, uh, um, Egypt uh, or, or Senegal are also prone to uh, sea level or also vulnerable to sea level rise so we're going to have some of these same phenomena um taking pl taking place in these these areas and that combination of data visualizations a lot of maps photography and 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 text was a great way of yeah you know, closing that 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 feedback loop between this is now this is going to happen in the future how do we how do we understand that relationship I think the wonderful thing about where we are right now is one, the amount of research that is being done in all these areas is huge. Uh, two, it's easy to, it, it's more easy than ever to find these people to access their research. I think there's a, a much stronger awareness that that message needs to be um, put out in the public domain. So I think there's a willingness to cooperate. And um, it's not only research and, and photography, there's other tools like data visualizations, uh, video uh, animations, all which can be used now in, in, yeah, which is fantastic as they've never, as we've never been able to use them before. There are more means of communications at our disposal, um, cheaper, easier, faster, um, it's easier to reach out to other people than there, I think there have ever been um, uh, to date and, and most certainly compared to 10, 15, 20 years ago. Challenges I've faced in, in creative projects um, wide and varied and I think one of the um, probably one of the most fundamental uh, and, and often overlooked is do we actually understand each other? Are we talking about the same thing? Uh, and uh, two great examples, and this is this is uh, a while ago. Um, we were doing a project on gender, uh, funded by an international NGO who wanted, who had certain interests in what, uh, in in thinking about gender. Um, and we were in Sri Lanka, and we found out that there wasn't a word, there wasn't a Sinhalese translation for the word gender. So where do you start a discussion from that point? It, it and and it actually we went back to the funder, um, so because we felt that was also only respectful from the, the 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 point of Sri Lanka. You know, we needed to find a new word. It it just wasn't there. And the same applied uh, in Mali to uh, environment, where there is um, uh, there they only had a very uh, classical definition of environment, which meant your surroundings, and there wasn't this connotation of 
um, something that needed to be uh, cared for, that that needed to be cherished, that needed to be protected or cleaned. Or um, so, all, are we talking about the same thing? And I think that applies to, uh, in in general, the uh, um, if you're talking about a story, are we talking about the same thing? But then, do we understand each other? All the way down when we're when we're uh, when when we're producing the story, um, uh, what is it exactly that you want? I, I would I would recommend people engage with the the um, with their clients to really understand the assignment that they've been given, um, because and this is something I experienced. I have I want something. I'm looking for something. But the reality is that I am not on the ground in uh, Nigeria or Mozambique or or Uganda. It, 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 it's uh, yes, I have scientific data, but you you also need to find that story, and that story is probably going to be slightly different from um, from what the research has described based on aggregated metadata. Uh, but but if you understand. And this is what I really appreciated with one of the photographers. Uh, she would call. She would say, "Okay, I've I've found this. Does this meet your requirements?" And it was really a discussion, um, uh, which brought us to her eventual topic. And that was very much her curiosity, uh, her perseverance, her her wanting to do some to to do a really good job. Um, which led to this this dialogue and a larger understanding eventually de- leading to uh, to her story. Mm-hmm.